Hey, what's up, everybody? Justin Ochoa back with episode 15 of the Gym Sessions podcast. Today, we have on a special guest, an expert in the world of sprint training, jump training, coaching, movement. We have on Joel Smith. Joel is the owner of Just Fly Sports. He's the host of one of my favorite podcasts, the Just Fly Performance Podcast. If you're not familiar with that, definitely check that out. He has courses and books such as Elastic Essentials, um, speed strength. Joel is really a genius when it comes to this stuff. Like the way he sees movement, the way he sees athleticism is second to none. And honestly, he's a guy that I've looked up to in the field for quite some time now. So to have him on the show and interview him and pick his brain was truly an honor and, and a fun experience for me. So again, in this episode, we kind of dive into jump training, but we kind of shovel it into the world of basketball and how basketball players can get the most out of their jump training. We talk about different jump styles, techniques. We talk about different movement qualities and movement methods to how athletes can get into these jumps. We talk a little bit about the play and the gamification of training and how that will help you guys get more out of your performance and more out of your, out of your athletes, especially your younger athletes. But again, this is a great show. Joel dives deep on all these topics. And again, it was truly an honor to have him on. It's episode 15. I hope you guys enjoy. Joel, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, Justin, thanks for having me here. This is always good to do. Absolutely, man. I'm excited. So first question I want to ask you is, how does it feel to be on the other side of a podcast? Yeah, oh, I, I do. I, I, I like doing this. I, I, I would hate to say like I like it more because I think it does. I know I don't want to like take away from I, I really love doing my podcast and, and finding new guests and things. But every time I get to do one of these, there's not that little stress of like, oh, you know, I hope this goes well. I hope I ask the right questions or whatever. It's <laughs> these are much more relaxing and mm -hmm. I always look forward to these. So I, I yeah. really do appreciate it. For sure, man. No, I love it. I'm, I'm glad that you're able to join and we can make this happen. So before we dive in, um, I do want to talk about your podcast and, and your book and just training in general, but I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself to the audience. Tell us who you are, what you do, and you can go as deep as you want, or you can you can be like, hey, I'm Joel. I get people fast. Like Whatever you want to do is cool. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I definitely have tried to make these all shorter as the years go on. Just, <laughs> it's almost the same thing as so with my podcast. I always talk about the guests before the episode rolls, and I've made it a point to have that little talk be shorter every year. And just trying to almost like yeah. talk less and have more like thought or meaning behind it or something. I tend to to get very carried away with with words. And so the short, my short and refined story is, and, and I know this is a lot of basketball themes here. So I grew up with a sport, first love of soccer, which eventually turned into basketball. I was tall for my age. Um, so basketball was one of my favorite sports and I always wanted to dunk. That was a like, at first, it was just touch the rim or touch mm -hmm. the net. It'd be so cool to touch the net. And then it'd be so cool to touch the rim and then dunk. And then can I do a windmill dunk? And 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 then track initially, which eventually I became much more immersed in for my job or for my writings. Uh, track was something initially to stay in shape for basketball on my radar. I love basketball. and But the thing is, is I was better at track. I had a late exposure to the skill of basketball. I think I had a lot of mental confidence. I was athletic and reactive, and I had all the potential for the skills of the game. But it was always mental, internal elements that actually kept me back from really being a good basketball player. Mm -hmm. So naturally, all that athleticism or whatever it was that I had kind of funneled into a more singular output of track and field. So the jumps and track, high jump, triple jump, and stuff, hurdles. Uh, went on to coach track and field uh, in Division Three. Uh, went on to somehow fell into being a Division One strength coach at Cal in my 30s, <laughs> uh, and then I I quit Cal. I quit Cal. I quit college. <laughs> I should just say I quit college coaching uh, for now. Uh, let two years ago to be full time just fly sports. Uh, so I work with people on the online space and the in person space. I coach youth sports. I coach youth soccer. Um, and I also run a podcast called the Just Fly Performance Podcast, which a lot of people who you'd say Joel Smith in the sports performance space, they probably maybe think of the podcast first thing. I started that 
a little over six years ago. I, I try to remember. I always remember because my daughter is going to be seven. So the podcast will mm. turn seven. Like it's, you know, I started it just shortly before she was born. I wasn't thinking about it in that perspective. Oh, I need to do this because I'm going to have a kid. I need to raise more <laughs> awareness or grow my business. I was just, I was just wanted to do it. So, and also I've, I've written some books and, and put together some educational products. And so if you had to say, what do I do? I, I coach, uh, I'm fascinated with human performance on all aspects. It's always been more output oriented as uh, track coach, Tony Holler said, track is the ultimate output sport. So if you want to talk jumping, sprinting, any sort of strength, any sort of, I mean, strength is part of track. You have to be, have a requisite level of strength. If you really want to measure strength, do powerlifting, but in terms of, Outputs relevant to most sports, track and field has always been a big passion of mine. And so I've just tried to expand that outwards into all elements of human performance. So skill acquisition, mental, the mental game, mental training, um, balancing strength and speed and skill, all these things uh, I've pushed forward. And having the opportunity to run a podcast has been a really big part of that because I'm regularly exposed to different ways of thinking and I'm always trying mm -hmm. to compile it and, and push my own envelope forward. Yeah. I was talking to, um, Mike Nilsson a couple episodes back and, and he has a podcast and we both agreed. And I think you could probably agree that the small, there's a small part of why you start a podcast from a selfish space of like, I want to learn from these people firsthand. And I want to like talk to people that I respect in the industry and gain that information and gain that knowledge. And, you know, for me, it's like, your podcast, um, I think since Spotify has been doing the the annual review, like I think your podcast yeah. has landed at number one on my annual podcast review for the last several years. And so now it's cool for me to have basically one of my favorite podcast hosts on my podcast. So I, again, just want to appreciate you for coming on. Yeah. Well, hey, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate that, that my podcast has popped up there and you're number one. That is a fun <laughs> thing on Spotify. I, I yeah. like seeing uh, the ones I've listened to, too. It gives me more awards for music, actually. Apparently, I'm like the time traveler, like the most. Yeah. Or something like. Yeah. That's, it's oh, that's cool awesome. They do. Like they review that. Yeah. I love that, man. So let's dive into um, the podcast, Just Fly Performance Podcast. Like you said, you've been doing it for six years, almost seven years now. And you've had, and we kind of talked before the show, like you've had everybody that you could possibly imagine on the show. Talk a little bit about just your podcast journey, um, where you want to take it in the next couple of years and kind of what your plans are there. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned it and I've heard other people mention it as well. Like I've, part of the reason I do this podcast was so I could learn from all these other people. Uh, for me, well, it's funny because I was so to myself for the longest time. I started the podcast at, I guess, let's see, I'm 39, so 33, yeah, somewhere in there. Uh, and, and all until then, I had always been very hesitant to reach out to other people to construct a program, for example, to mm -hmm. or anything. I was always very much, I'm going to do it myself. That was always my mindset and my mentality. Even school, I mean, I wasn't a great student um, by virtue of really needing to do it myself. I wouldn't pay attention in class even very well. I was a little <laughs> ADD. I may have even been diagnosable on some level. I don't know. Um, but I would always study the books later and just go take the test and be fine. And I was always mm -hmm. like, I'm going to study it myself. I'm going to learn it myself and even my own training process. And I'll say too, a lot of people know me as a podcast host and I view one of the hats I wear as still an athlete. I mean, I plan on competing in Masters Track this summer. I still love, I play ultimate Frisbee once a week with like these minor league baseball players at a local gym. I nice. live to play and compete and measure myself uh, on, and a lot of the information I've gained, I've been able to utilize with that. But uh, you know, up until 33, it was always, um, how can I do that? How can I learn myself? And I, I struggled immensely reaching out to other people. Partly, I think there was a self-centeredness to that that I've been working to overcome. There was also like maybe that was just the habit of how I did it. Mm. I think the the benefit of that was I do think I cultivated a strong intuition. You know, you could call it a BS meter on a level. And I think I've always I've always been a skeptic of so many things. I've been told so many coaching cues and things by different coaches where I was like, really? Like, are you sure I'm supposed to do it that way? You know, maybe to a fault sometimes, but I always turned it over in my own body to try to figure out if this was the right thing. 
And so when I went to start the podcast, a lot of that impetus, well, one, I will say the first reason was I saw other people doing podcasts. At the time, it was like Mike Robertson, Physical Preparation, Pacey Performance, mm -hmm. uh, Jay DeMeo in Central Virginia. And I'm like, okay, I think to be a complete website educational resource, I should do this. And then I also, the second thought was, I just need to get out of my own shell and just start talking to other people and asking them questions more because I have up until this point in my life, I have really not done a good job of that. And I know it's something I need to do to grow. And there is a little bit of a comfort zone thing. I think too, within even how I operate, I've been the person, I remember when I was little, like probably third, fourth grade, people called me the professor because mm -hmm. I would always read these books. Like if it was self-learning, I could do it for days. Um, and yeah. I would read these books and just, I could store facts like a computer and I would spit out all these facts to my friends or whatnot. And they called me the professor because I knew all these things. And so I think because of that, I always carried this validation, like, oh, people like me because I know this stuff. And so part of overcoming that validation is reaching out to others. And even within my own podcast, trying to keep that voice of, I think sometimes there's a temptation for a host to be a, to do one upsmanship, you know, oh, mm -hmm. let me tell you how much I know about that. And I probably do that too much on my own podcast, but <laughs> I'll just say doing this has helped me to, to see that in myself and to really <clears throat> expand into the knowledge. I would almost call it like the collective consciousness of human performance at what everybody knows out there. And <clears throat> part of the fun thing about doing this whole thing like at first, you know, we talked about this before the show, you find everybody, you know, in your immediate space, like what are the, mm -hmm. who are the 20, 30, 40 coaches I, I know of that, <clears throat> that are popular, that I've learned from that people I know have learned from, um, that, you know, for a variety of reasons. And then you interview all those people and you, you learn from that wave. And then you eventually, you kind of reach the end of that bubble. You kind of reach the you've, you've kind of hit everyone. I don't like to call it. I don't feel like it's not, it's not like it's, it's, um, that's like a limiting term. I don't necessarily like that, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. Like there's, yeah. there's this field of knowledge and you kind of tap that field to a the level. And now, well, I got to go into a different field now to kind of, and it's, and I think that maybe it was Brett Bartholomew who had said this was that strength and conditioning is not as interdisciplinary as other fields of study in the mm -hmm. sense of, I think he was referring to maybe like medicine or business or these other psychology, these fields wanting to tap other fields and learn from the things in other fields. But the thing is, is human performance by nature is so expansive. Like it, it is, it is, I mean, we have strength and conditioning, which is such a teeny little speck compared to just fitness <laughs> right yeah and we have i mean there is i mean you have within you know st even strength and conditioning you have olympic lifting power lifting sprint training and track and field motor learning psychology and relationships you know injury prevention which is a weird kind of right <laughs> wide spanning <laughs> thing in and of itself um so, you know, you have all this stuff uh, long-term development uh, actually when i in my own podcast now I have a, a spreadsheet with all those topics and the coaches that I've had on that I've really enjoyed and coaches I hope to speak to. And those topics expand. So the number of topics. And but the thing is, is I think that what's what is really interesting is by hearing someone's voice outside of the typical, you can gain more insight into that original field. Let's say my original mm -hmm. field was just speed training. I, well, you know what? Sometimes by listening to someone, a really good coach in CrossFit, for example, like I just had Julian Pinot on my podcast, who's not a CrossFit coach per se, but he is very well known in CrossFit. And if you're in strength and conditioning, human performance, you, you shun CrossFit because it's like the opposite of everything you stand for, which is reasonable <laughs> yeah. volumes and more functional <laughs> movements and all this stuff. And then you have just like blowing up by barbells. And But it's almost like because strength and conditioning is so like anti-CrossFit, there's some really brilliant coaches in CrossFit, not to mention if you look at some of those athletes and Julian was saying the female athletes at the games, their work capacity is unbelievable. Crazy. It yeah. is unreal. And we can learn a lot by studying that process. Even if you don't like CrossFit, I mean, I'm, you're not going to catch me doing, you know, a Metcon. I mean, I guess I probably should at some point in my life just to do it and feel, <laughs> right. just to feel this thing. I, and I like working hard too. Um, 
But anyways, it's been really cool to kind of like look at these fields and expand my original journey by, by studying more um, of the corners and expanding my bubble or field or whatever as I've gone along. No, I love that, man. That's a great outlook. And uh, <laughs> I have a funny story that kind of came to mind when you said CrossFit. So a couple years back, I went to uh, the Arnold Classic and I stayed with my buddy uh, who lives out in Columbus and he's a power lifter. Uh, if I had to categorize him, I would say he's a power lifter. So he had another guy in from Cali, another buddy um, that was built like him. You know, they had the same kind of vibe. And I'm like, okay, he's obviously a power lifter. Like, that's why they're friends. So that guy had a podcast. And he's like, hey, we should do a podcast right here. Like, we could just knock it out right now. And in that podcast, I kind of shit on CrossFit a little bit mm -hmm. and like made like a snarky remark. Well, after the, he didn't say anything to me. It, it, everybody kind of laughed it off. After the podcast, he was like, Hey, you know, I own a CrossFit box, right? And I was <laughs> like, What? I didn't uh -oh, even like, uh -oh. you know, you don't fit, you know, what I was, I guess, stereotyping a, a CrossFitter to be. But it was just so funny. And then we had a good conversation about that. He's like, Look, I understand why you said that. It makes sense. But then talking to him, you understand how serious they take the Olympic lifts, like from a technique standpoint. So you can pull from that or how serious they take, um, you know, just working hard in general. Like you can, like you said, you can always take certain bits and pieces, even if it's not your thing per se, you can have a nice takeaway from that. If you go into it with an open mind. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in there. Like it was, um, Julian was part of CrossFit Invictus, which is in LA. Mm. And I actually started listening to the podcast that the gym owner there does kind of on account of him in that little sphere of things. And there is so much to be found even in things that we, you know, even if we're a little opposed to it, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there's still, and even still, like, you have to respect someone who's reached a high level in yeah. any discipline. Oh, there's so much to learn from that. And mm -hmm. there's, I think almost a different, yeah, you know, I, it's funny cause I, uh, the gym that I contract out of, so I, I train athletes out of a gym. Mm -hmm. about 15 minutes from my house which is very much a, it's not outright crossfit i think they just opened a crossfit chapter but the people go there because i, I my the snarky side of me says they go there because they want to get their ass kicked mm. <laughs> because yeah i mean there is something like with people you know there and there's a good feeling people associate with that you know the problem might be if your life is stressful and then you're tapping more str a stressful thing on your right. life routinely that could be a problem but Part of being in that gym has helped me to understand. I, I mean, you even look at it beyond. There's like, you find me a CrossFit gym that doesn't have like a very serious, at least you know, set of like discipline, community. Like, mm -hmm. if you look at like, um, like value systems, uh, oftentimes within the conservative ecosphere, as opposed as as opposed to the liberal ecosphere, I it's been very cool for me to be a part of that ecosphere. Even if I'm not necessarily going to do all your workouts, I really enjoy seeing that community. And it's taught me a lot about that side of things. So and fitness is so, it's so expansive. I, I think too, it would be so easy to say, oh, you should never do that workout. It's stupid. Well, I don't know. You could do that for a little bit. And there's some things. With, right. So anyways, yeah, it's, it's been good to expand my bubble with that as well. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So uh, appreciate the insight on the on the podcast and the things. Now, I do kind of want to hit on your book because your book, um, Speed Strength, or no, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, is that right? Speed Strength? Yeah, the yeah, Speed Strength, okay. the old ones, Vertical Foundations. Old yeah, old. okay. Um, Speed Strength was the one I was thinking of that I most recently read. Uh, I That changed my opinion on a lot of things, just like lifting wise and the way that you talk about shin angles, the way that you talk about um, just applying some of the concepts from athleticism into a traditional weight room setting, I think was really cool. So I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of touch on that book a little bit. Tell us kind of the nuts and bolts of that and then, you know, where obviously people can pick that up if they want to learn more. Yeah, for sure. Um just a second. I completely apologize. I 99.9% .9 of the time, by the way, my phone is silenced. <laughs> I unsilenced it literally just because I was expecting a call an hour ago and I forgot. So I totally, so sorry about that. No, it's um, all good. Real, it's all good. real stuff here, real stuff here. Um, yep. Anyways, 
Yeah. So, man, I, I will say it is interesting with, with speed strength and kind of as my evolution has gone, like especially within basketball, I mentioned this on a show recently. Who was it with? It might have been Zach Evan Esch, I think, mm. uh, who's really big on like old old time type studying the old time greats and more like of a raw Rocky style training. And mm -hmm. I was I made a comment on that show. Yeah, if I coach basketball, like high school basketball, I would just dude like I, I just do isos like uh, iso you know the only physical you could totally get away with this and it might make it better like just do like iso lunges iso push-ups maybe some wall sits or iso superman holds basically just body weight holds some hex deadlifts and you know some push-ups do you really how much more and you think anything beyond that for the game how much do you absolutely need that you know like and but it I'll say like I, my, my thoughts on strength training and sport have constantly kind of turned themselves over throughout the years. And so speed strength was probably, um, uh, let me, let me back up just a little bit. I used to think, cause I think this is important. I always try to find things that are in people's head, like anchor points that are in my head at some point that I know are in other people's heads. Mm -hmm. And I heard this phrase maybe 10, 15 years ago, let's say. And it didn't make sense to me 15 years ago, which was athletes use a different strength than power lifters. And in my head at the time, I'm like, well, strength is strength. Like you should, right. how can you be strong for your sport if you can't squat a lot? How can you be strong if you can't deadlift a lot? And I, I'm, and I'm always tying this to outputs too, because I'm thinking, okay, like if you're to jump higher, you can't jump high and squat 135. You, right. you, you have to have like a requisite. And for me, up until that point, which was in my mid 20s, I had been benefiting from increased levels of strength for the most part. As I moved through high school, the stronger I got. Now, I wasn't because the strength was coming in fairly easily all through high school. I never obsessed about it. I didn't I didn't go too hard on it. It was at a self pace, my intuitive pace. Again, like I said, I was someone who you couldn't tell me nothing. You know, I'm going to do things the way that feels right to me. And in looking back, the way I approached strength all through high school in my early 20s was this just feels right. And I didn't really start putting that grindstone down until I would say I got into my mid 20s. And it was until that point where I started to see, oh, yes, you can get stronger. And it actually, A, now isn't moving the needle as I thought, maybe standing vertical and standing broad jump, but oh man, my running jump wasn't getting better. My track sprint time isn't getting better, if, if not getting worse. Um, and so then you start to ask questions. Well, why, what am I missing here? What, and I'll say this as well, as I think the programs that most strength coaches give athletes are more representative of what I was doing in my 20s than before that. My intuitive sense before that, honestly, it was lower volume. It was closer to easy strength. Dan John, it was sometimes it was just one set of 10. <laughs> and then it was go play your sport. And it was be explosive. Try to dunk after games. Try to beat your, your teammates in the wind sprints. Like that kind of thing. Go do track. And so I think that when I originally heard there's a different kind of strength in athletics, it didn't resonate until I personally hit that point where strength, traditional strength wasn't working anymore. And then that really made me, and then throughout the next years, I would see, I, I saw this as a track coach. I'd have athletes come in who never had lifted, you know, who were pretty good. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to get them stronger and they're going to be even better. You're, and I had two instances in particular that was so always burned in my brain. It was a, a guy and a girl. They, they, um, they were both like 400 meter types coming in. So, which is like, think of like a lankier sprinter, but still really fast and explosive. One of them, they were both long jump too. And I remember both of them, I got way stronger. The girl went from squatting 155 to 225 for reps in a fall and had a horrible track season. Horrible. She did so bad. She also gained probably, she gained a little bit of weight too, probably from partying and stuff that never helps. But it was very clear that that increased strength was absolutely not helping her and not even her short sprints either. You'd think, Oh, 400. Well, of course, no, she wasn't better at the, like the short sprints, the hundred, the 60, the long jump, like none of it. Um, and then I had a guy pretty much the same thing. His clean went way up. He obviously squat. He'd never lifted. Like, you know, I, I, his lifts were all going up 
and he was not any faster than high school. I remember asking him what his workouts were in high school and I'd like laugh. It's like no lifting, you know, like this day it's sprint, this day just run a mile and that's it. Like, <laughs> you know, and you were that much better. Like, and I was just, I was, and I had a, um, a kid from Sweden, a long jumper who had not lifted that much coming to the United States and his long jump got better, but his high jump after lifting with me and getting way stronger got a lot worse. And I, you know, at that point, when you're confronted with these things in track and field, which is the output sport, you have to ask yourself, okay, is what I'm doing really, really helping these individuals? Um, at the same time, I was training the basketball team at the college, the Division Three college, and I did get good results doing the kind of weight training and plyometric protocols with them. But the big thing with the, the difference was, is it's, it's, all, it's all complex. There's all a lot of factors as they... The basketball team did great. We did lifting and plyos and depth jumps and the basic, you know, some cleans and that Olympic lifts and that kind of thing. And I remember watching them in their layup line at their first game. And I was like, man, these guys are all jumping like three or four inches higher, like definitively. So this is good. But then I got these track kids who are not doing better. <laughs> and, and part of it is the fact of the basketball, playing basketball, playing a team sport keeps you more reactive without question. So it is multifactorial, but all these questions have, have sat in my system over time. And I'm always asking, I, I never, I don't care what you squat. I don't care what you deadlift. I don't care what you clean. All I care about is, did you get faster? Did you jump higher? What are your injury rates? I, I work with swimming. Did you swim faster? And how do you feel? How do you feel out there on the court or whatever you're doing? And then finally, do you care too much about the physical side because you're not very good at your sport? So you're going to retreat to the weight room where you can feel good about yourself. When the fact is to truly level up, you actually have to care less about the weight room and you maybe even have to care less about your jumping or sprinting on some level. And you have to only care about the game. That was my problem is I cared about being able to do a windmill dunk, honestly, more than I cared about being able to make good decisions on the basketball court. That's why I wasn't as good of a basketball player and I did track instead. So it's, um, yeah, it's all a lot of things to think about. And then, you know, speed strength is, was the result of that. So I, I, mm -hmm. I have a, uh, a habit of sometimes starting to talk about something and not going back to the original question. So speed strength was, what are the things that really matter in the gym that makes someone faster in a linear sprint, the 40 yard dash, mm -hmm. the 100 meter dash, whatever. And so it's basically my compilation. I wrote it at age 35. It was kind of like a capstone on my career at the time as a strength coach and speed coach for track athletes or anyone who wants to get faster. And so a lot of the book, I wouldn't say the book was definitive and said, that this is how this is how you must do it. But I think hopefully in reading that people were able to start I, and I have workout programs in the book and stuff, but mm -hmm. I think if nothing else, I think the book both gives workout ideas, but it also hopefully helps people to ask questions as to weightlifting and Olympic lifting and powerlifting not being the end all and be all that so often we think it is and how to find a better balance in that process. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, that's definitely what I took away from it. And, and like you said, there that leads me right to my first major training question is the whole concept of just get stronger, just jump, just, you know, just do X, Y, Z. Um, and I think, like you said, there's a point where that stuff works. And then there's also a point where it stops to work. Uh, maybe you need to do something else and come back to it. Not that it can never work again. It's just like, there, there are several different roadblocks that you'll hit along the way if you have a long training career or a long athletic career. So in terms of like jump training, we can just start there. Jump training, um, you know, a lot of people will just say just squat more or mm -hmm. squat deeper or just jump, practice jumping, just get stronger, things like that. What happens when that stops working? What are some of the things that, that we can turn to and I guess some ways that we know, um, hey, this might not be the thing for right now. Sure. So one of the things, and honestly, this is something that I think a few kind of lasers of knowledge have kind of come together even more recently in the last year for me in thinking about a few things in terms of when does squatting or deadlifting stop? 
working for you as well as it could. And I would see this in my time at Cal, especially this was a great time to see this on a broad scale. I worked with nearly or probably around in any, any given year between 80 and 110 athletes there. And mm -hmm. so I was able to see trends very clearly with, all right, we're coming in, we're going to do lifting. What happens to your vertical jump? Almost inevitably, I would say five to six weeks into any program was when most people's gains, immediate gains in vertical kind of tapped out. They would always come in out of shape. We start doing some basic strength. There's vertical. And this is just standing, by the way. This is standing vertical is not running too. And that's an important distinction. But just for a very basic mm -hmm. guideline, I would see a very quick uptick for five or six weeks. And then usually, honestly, a pretty much a flat line for the rest of the year. <laughs> and... How much was that my programming specifically? How much was it their sport, what they were doing in their sport, their consistency throughout the year? Um, how much a vertical even mattered? If I'm working with a tennis player, whether you have, you know, whether you jump 28 or 30 on the just jump, how much is that going to matter for you, your success of the tennis season? Honestly, people might not like this answer, but I would say it's pretty close to zero. <laughs> the more important <laughs> thing is that you're staying healthy um, and that right. you're confident in your abilities. Um, so, but a lot of, but here's what I would also see is that people who I felt like were innately more athletic, more powerful, more skilled and doing those things as part of their sport. So the big thing would be like a track and field triple jumper, let's say, or a 50 meter sprinter in swimming. Those athletes I felt could go longer into the season getting upticks. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is like, well, what? helps general strength to hit more uh well what helps it to what makes more of a difference because and dan bach has jump science has said this and this was one of the things that got my wheels spinning is basically an unathletic kid who comes in who lifts more isn't going to see that much of a needle move on their dynamic stuff an athletic kid who comes in and hasn't really lifted and this kind of contrasts with my track thing a little bit but i'll, I'll kind of I think I can unpack why. And the answer is never so reductionist with this. The, the most popular videos on YouTube or whatever are always very reductionist. Do this, not that, you know, yeah. and you feel like you have the answer. And then you start doing whatever the guy said for a few weeks and you realize that maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. And you, you just not something that is sticked with often. The answers are oftentimes a little more nuanced. So, the athletes that I think general strength works more for are the ones with a broader skill base, the people who are more athletic. Someone who comes in and is more athletic and gets stronger is going to get more out of that lift than someone who is really unathletic and unskilled. And so, and then even then there's going to be a window. And I think a big one to look at with that is like, you look at like pro dunkers, like someone like a Jordan Kilgone like type person. I don't think he really lifted until he was like 17 or 18 or something. Like he just dunked right. and played and did all the play and had this huge library of jumping ability and skill. And like, this is physical education, you know? Right. This is do all the skills early and really capitalize on that and then slowly and intentionally put strength in the program. And it's like, and, and in talking to Jordan, like when his lifts are good, his jumps are really good. And he's a two, he is a two-foot jumper, so that's going to be more strength-oriented in nature. And so for him, that's part of his system. Um, when it comes to track and field, but Jordan is not amazing off one leg. He's got, he doesn't look like a long jumper when he jumps off one leg, let's put it that way. So like, or you think about LeBron, like who's making a cut down the lane and jumps off one leg. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you are a more of a strength-reliant two-foot jumper, that strength component will work for you longer if you have the prerequisite, <laughs> tripping over words, the prerequisite base of athletic movement and skill. You can intake that strength and it will stick with you longer into your jump journey. If you're someone who's more of a one leg jumper, it might stick with you less long before it starts to be too much for you. But regardless of who you are, you need a prerequisite of basic skills and athletic abilities. And while you're doing the strength, you also should be doing basic, like playing basketball, playing sports, playing right. different sports, playing games, because otherwise the strength starts to, you always need to be balancing the strength work you're doing. And I think that was something that I didn't do as well as I could have with those track kids that didn't succeed as much, um, is they were just doing my track workouts, which I felt like were good, but 
Funny enough, the kids who are playing at when I was coaching track, the kids who are playing intramural basketball when they kind of quote unquote shouldn't have been because they were track athletes, they seem to do better and preserve more reactive and (laughs) elastic qualities than those kids I said who, you know, who just trained and lifted. And so that is another factor and variable to put in there as well. Was it just the lifting that made those kids not optimal or was it something else they weren't getting? And so all this being said, I definitively can tell you, you need to have a good base of athletic skills and abilities that comes from playing multiple sports and not just multiple sports, but also being an athletic human, which means climb, crawl, do like parkour and ninja stuff Mm -hmm. when you're little, like spinning kicks and you know, all the stuff. Like it's not just even playing sports. It's all the stuff, all the stuff a kid would do, everything you do in PE. And like Jeremy Frisch says, once you miss some of those windows, it is harder to get back later. So the better the base, the more that general strength, I think, can transfer. And then it transfers to the level of your reactiveness. If you're a springy one-leg jumper, a little less. If you're a two-leg power jumper, a little bit more. Um, And then you need to be doing reactive stuff along the way. So those are the basics. I hope I sum that up well because it's like I'm t- I'm saying, oh, well, what about this? What about that? Because it is. <laughs> Life is what about this and what about that? Yeah, for but sure. I think the, the mark of where I've, you know, I think that an experienced coach should be able to then say, to come back and say, well, here are at least the big first principles and rocks of that. So hopefully I sum that up decently well. Yeah. So a side point, a side note to that is I, like I have this theory and you're actually the perfect person to to run it by. Um, Jeremy would be another person I think would understand. So I work with athletes of all levels, right? I've got pros and I've got kids. And I've noticed like a lot of times some of their warmups are going to be similar. We might do some type of skip or some type of crawl or something like that, whether you're 26 making millions of dollars or you're a sixth grader. Like I think that's still – a good thing to involve. So I've noticed over the years that a lot of times the kids are just better at, at the skips and the crawls Mm -hmm. than the adults. And especially if we're talking like pro athletes, I have this theory that at some point in a young kid's life, it's pretty apparent if they have the potential to be pro, like they're just special. And so what happens is a coach will see that and basically misuse that to win games in Mm -hmm. middle school, which doesn't matter. And so while they're winning games year round, and we're talking basketball here, which is probably the worst of the worst at doing this (laughs) while they're (laughs) winning games year round, they're skipping steps of this athletic puzzle, like the skipping, the tag, the crawling, the falling off of things that are really, really high and figuring out how to not break your leg. Like, so while I think it is good for them to experience the high level of play to some extent, um, I think it's also bad that they miss out on some of these rudimentary things. So now here we are 10 to 12 years later and we're still learning how to skip with them while mm-hmm. the sixth grader is making it look so smooth and they're like, why can't I do that? Does that, does that theory like make sense to you? And like, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that was, you know, there was a post that I had recently on social media on rhythm and it's like not many people understand it. Sadly, like compared to, you know, Hey, do these exercises that everybody loves. As soon as you start talking about more, what I would call core biological or even psychological components, it's almost like there's less years to want to pick up on that. And rhythm, I think it attunes to rhythm on a large level. Mm. And it's like we are rhythmic creatures. We have a heart rate that's on a rhythm. We have breathing that should be on a rhythm. And in fact, if you've done, um, there's a breathing um, or a, a monitor called heart math. And the more synchronized your breathing is, like let's say every breath, it's four seconds in, eight seconds out, or four and four, or whatever, as long as it's always the same your the score of your heart rate the way they analyze your heart it gets better as soon as the breathing is kind of out of whack and it's not consistent your heart rate coherence score gets worse and funny enough that heart rate coherence score they've put together fits with uh reaction time in sport they found it athletes have a higher a better heart coherence as 
uh, related to their consistency and breathing, they go out and they make better decisions in their sport. The reaction time is better. I've felt that myself without question. Uh, that's just one aspect of rhythm. Another is just watch playing basketball. You, you're juking out the defender. You have, you know, as you go back and forth, uh, you are going to see a rhythm. Like basketball, because it a ball bounces and it beats, it's a rhythmic yep. opportunity. And I actually think that that, whether you, for me, that actually showed up in my track a lot. I'm a really rhythmic athlete. You'd see it in my run-ups, like my high jump run-up or anything like that. You watch me do, like I watch myself, I do a her post a hurdle jump video or something now, and I'm seeing this rhythmic like generation at the beginning of the approach to that. And all that being said is I think sometimes we lose the sense. It's not, in some ways, it's not getting something new that you never had. It's remembering something you've always had. And I think that's so cool because Ooh, I, yeah. I have my own kids. They're four and six. And I watch like these little six-year-olds playing soccer that, like you said, some of them are not going to be, you know, the high school varsity or the whatever. But some of these kids, you can see it already that they are so wired and athletic and aggressive and on it. And mm -hmm. those, you know, those abilities are seen very early. But no matter what, you ask those kids to skip and they all have rhythm because they grow up doing it. My kids, for example, you, you, you crawl, then you learn to walk. Then you learn to, to run. Then you learn to gallop, not skip right away. It's gallop. It's a kind of an asymmetrical da 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 mm -hmm. And then you learn to skip. But you watch kids gallop, and they all do it. Like It's just fun. And it's like them rhythmically learning the art of a jump takeoff, for example, like a, a kick, like all the skills that are asymmetrical that have that da-da to it. A child is already automatically in your blood rehearsing that on their own. And then it turns into skipping. And we all have that internal rhythm. And I don't know if it's just like getting slapped in the face with life or like just getting into this hailstorm of sport that's specialized and drill oriented and do it this way. And, you know, everything in sport is so cerebral. It's so um, like it's just like it's like it's like one forebrain talking to another forebrain when in reality it's not really the forebrain that's in charge for the, most of these skills. Right. And it's, I find that kind of funny. Um, and so it's even to the point where like, if you go to Kenya, there's documentaries on this and, and I've uh, instructed athletes and in, not even sprinting, but just running. Like I've worked with military trainees on their one and a half mile run, their four mile run. And so I'm very interested in how do you just instruct run training? Because that will make you humble real quick if you're ready to be humbled because you can tell someone to sprint a certain way and they'll do it to humor you. But running, like you're going to get tired really fast doing anything that's not efficient. You're just going to go to something else. And it's yep. that's a very, you have to be really attuned to the nuances of humans. And long story short, that is the Kenyans, if you go to the Kenyan like elite running camps, they start with rhythm. If you can learn rhythm, you can learn running there. And they have these videos of people doing step up class to the rhythm. And because it's, it's, you think about, we are adaptable creatures. Running is in our blood. Like watch an animal on the nature channel. You think you need to coach it. I mean, there's reasons. So it's not so much that we need to be taught. It's more that we need to remember who we are. And rhythm is part of that. And once we have the rhythm, the body can go with that. And so to me, a first principle, if you will, of teaching anything is teaching the rhythm behind that thing. And so with that said, I think that, yeah, like you, I, I like doing skips and crawls, even with older athletes. But I also believe in a what you would call a transcend and include model, which means that uh, I actually just wrote this up for a sprint acceleration course that I'm coming out with. And it's basically this thing that like, okay, you have these base pyramid, you have the bottom pyramid of skills. And I view it, what I viewed for my children or physical education, they roll, they crawl, they walk, they eventually jog. And then yep. the next layer up you have, uh, on the bottom I also put like you gallop because they gallop early. The next layer up is you sprint, you skip, you swing a baseball bat, you strike. Like there's, and they all build on each other. The, and then the next one up would be just flat out sprinting the way we see it in you know more elite sport or something like that. And so a lot of the things in the base layer is seen in the next layer and then it's seen in the next layer. But here's the trick is, if you watch an athlete like playing basketball, like a lot of these low level things, like a good one, a lot of these low level things you'll see in the sport. Like you'll see, if you see rhythm when someone plays, 
I don't think they need to do a ton of rhythm work outside of that because it's already in, it's already in there. You know what I'm saying? It's, right. it's, it's in their system. So for them, I don't, you know, like, I mean, I, I like doing a little bit of it just to, it's fun. It's it reminds you who you are, but I think some mm-hmm. athletes need a lot more of that than others. If you don't have rhythm, I mean, that's almost one of the first things I'll do with new clients. I should say almost, it's always in the first day is it, Hey, just go skip. And even more than running, you can see how an athlete operates. A lot of times they're trying to manufacture what a coach told them about skipping for brain back at, you know, <laughs> yeah. in their early development, you'll see them trying to drive their knee, trying to the worst, you know, they're forcing it when they're forcing their hand up. If they're like throwing their hand up, that's a push. <laughs> that's a volitional. They're yep. trying too hard. So when I have athletes skip, I, I want to teach them to remember what it was like to skip when they were five, you know, and, and, and Hey, this is inside you already. Here's all the things you've done that have kind of, it's almost like you're trying to chip away all the pieces of them that are holding themselves back from an innate rhythm they've always had. And so I think that to sum that up with your thought on it is I think that all, I, I have all athletes do these things, but athletes who have forgotten who they really are need to do a lot more of it. And then there's the final caveat of like Jeremy Frisch. There is only sadly so much that you can get back if you haven't done these things early. But then the trick in coaching is if you go tell athletes that, it's going to be a nocebo or a big downer. <laughs> You're going to be like, oh, right. you're screwed. You didn't play enough yeah. of this or do enough of this when you were a kid. You've been only playing one sport forever and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I will say other, the other thing too is like, like swinging is one of those early ones. I think like that's the dichotomy between like basket or baseball and tennis and then playing a court sport, you know, like, so I think that to kind of look at the different skills and the different sports as well kind of helps you to understand what to have with, a well-roundedness. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. I love the the rhythm aspect. That's something to really, really think about and, and dive in on because, like you said, it's it's all there. That's a good way to put it. It's all there. It's just you have to remember who you were and, and bring it back, kind of chip it away. So, one thing I did want to jump in, not jump in, no pun intended. I wanted to jump in on jump training a little bit deeper, and I've heard you. A lot, a lot of episodes talking about different structures and jump height or jump styles. So, you know, you got your, your narrow and your wide, you've got your, your one foot takeoff, your two foot, even right, left or left, right, whatever the case may be. I just wanted to kind of learn more about the wide and narrow um, and kind of how that feeds into a jump style or any correlations that you might see in terms of athleticism there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that generally speaking, <clears throat> your why, and this is the thing is there is a, there is a spectrum mm-hmm. and I'm always looking at how can I not <laughs> you, there's a balance with all this stuff because you don't want to over type cast athletes and you don't want to, um, I think sometimes create a self-fulfilling prophecy for somebody. Mm-hmm. And with the infrasternal angle, which is basically the angle created at the bottom of your rib cage, uh, you do have a, a spectrum of you have people who are wider with that angle and then people who are very narrow. Uh, a very narrow, you could think like a Zach Levine, like a guy who's like big one foot jumper, uses a lot of rotation, super elastic. Um, wide ISA. I'm trying to actually think of like an NBA, you know, it's funny because I've heard of LeBron James being suggested as a wide ISA, but he's super elastic and jumps off one foot, yeah. but he's not, <laughs> I wouldn't say he's super rotational. Maybe, maybe that's the difference. Um, yeah. You know, he's a very powerful, LeBron's a very powerful individual, but that's where, again, I think that I, you can see these things show up a lot more in track and field uh, in many ways. Uh, with the general thing, though, is uh, to, to determine the difference, a narrow athlete tends to do everything narrower. They stand with a narrower stance. They are more like bouncy, like a bouncing ball type person. They rotate. They have a lot of rotation. Think of like a baseball pitcher. That's like a really whippy, long baseball pitcher. That's mm-hmm. the ultimate narrow. A wide would be probably like an NFL lineman. Think like a brick. They don't, they're like, they're like literally like kind of a brick. They don't rotate necessarily out. Maybe D line, they need to like sneak through and stuff like that and rotate. 
Um, but someone who is a little bit more solid, they have a wider stance. They like wider stances when they squat. Uh, they oftentimes they end up being a little bit more bow legged type individuals. And so the big things that I just really look at with those types is honestly, the only real big training difference is, and this, you could figure this out without, out of her knowing like a wide or a narrow is just whatever they're good at, do more of that. And so mm. You, again, you don't need to know the specifics, but whatever an athlete is good at, you usually want to capitalize on that strength. Narrow, like a Zach Levine, he's probably really good at plyometrics and like bouncy stuff and, and maybe like longer sprints or something like that, even shorter sprints. He probably doesn't love like heavy, deep squats and stuff like that. And so someone like that, I would tend to do more you know, explosive um I would tend to do more, ply more plyometric type work if it wasn't already contrasting with what they're doing in their sport. I would be more careful with heavy axial loading. So I'd probably stick to more like Dan John has said this. He's like, if you're not built to squat, don't do under sets of 10. For me, that usually lands more around eight. Like I would probably mm -hmm. stick with a heels elevated, sets of eight, not super heavy on squats. I would try to get more out of more explosive stuff like medicine ball throws, explosive sandbag work. Yeah. Um, do like dynamic lunges, dynamic weighted lunges. Uh, I would do more body weight isos as part of the strength component of things with an athlete like that. With an athlete who's more like a wide ISA, who just had that wider stance, that sturdier build, who probably liked the weight room a little more. I, I like the idea of um, like that that you know brick power forward who's kind of just that strong physical force type person, and they like the weight room. They get confidence from the weight room. Yeah, I'll let you lift more because that's what you're good at. And you perceive yourself as being good at that. And you perceive your strength as being an important part of your game. So maybe we will do more heavy squats, axial loading, hex bar deadlifts, stuff like that for you to hang your hat on. And sometimes wides don't do as well with a lot of plyos. They may have less like, they're a little bit less like externally rotated. This is another one too you can look at is when a narrow is standing uh, Alex Effort calls this valgus arms. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> even the way they stand is they're, they'll stand and their palms are kind of facing out. Their elbows are in towards their body and their arms are kind of like rotating out towards mm -hmm. the side. So their arms are, are literally like externally rotated. Whereas a wide, a lot of times their arms are more internal. I think like a gorilla kind of like, mm -hmm. or, you know, like walk in like a gorilla or something like that, or, you're doing a lat spread pose. You're a bodybuilder doing a lat spread pose and you're internally rotating your arms. That would be something that a wide ISA would be more likely to be in that posture. Uh, but a narrow infrasternal angle being in that externally rotated position, what's good about being more externally rotated is you're more ready to load elastically. So basically anything, like let's say bounding, like big long steps or bounding. Every time your foot gets ready to hit the ground, a, a narrow can take advantage of being more externally rotated. Uh, it's called like an on-ramp to prepare for the ground hit. So mm -hmm. they have, they're basically, they're more of a bouncing ball because of that. A wide may have less of an on-ramp. So meaning they can't hit the ground with as quite as much external rotation to prepare themselves. So they have a limit with how much elastic energy they can load in each based off their ability to externally rotate. But on the other hand, they are extremely powerful going the other way in internal rotation. So think sprinting, like a 60-meter, a 40-yard dash, someone who's fast at the 40. And not that narrows can't be good at the 40. There's some very fast narrows. But the wide has a real powerful ability to internally rotate towards midline. You'll see them running, and you'll see that arm in front, and you'll see pec, front shoulder, bicep popping out, that mm -hmm. like a super explosive, tense crossing of the body. And so a wide can maybe do more sled sprints as part of their preparation, uh, even sled bounding, because it's kind of this more forceful hit and they're, they're never getting too high in the air, that kind of thing. I would just avoid for wides, I would avoid more of like the high depth jumps. I would avoid a lot of bounding. Um, I would have them do more power stuff. And they're probably going to like the power stuff more. If you have a wide say, hey, I want you to bound. And I don't even think basketball players honestly need to learn to bound. So I, I'm just talking about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but a, an athlete who's really bad at bounding 
probably not going to have them bound that much. I, I, and basketball, there's no reason to get better at it for the most part. Like there is, but I would, what I would do in that, I just, I'm, I'll wrap it up with this and maybe I could talk about this later, but I would, I would just have them, I would just lay out like for basketball, instead of trying to make you a track athlete, honestly, I'd rather turn into parkour where like I have, like here's a 12 inch box, eight feet apart from that, here's an 18 inch box, seven feet apart from that, here's a six inch box and just have them bound across the boxes just to solve a problem mm-hmm. where I'm not like making you learn the technique of another sport. I'm just having you do something explosive with level changes that's fun. And by you doing this drill with explosive fun level changes, you'll get a little better at bounding, but you'll get, it's more the explosiveness needed to like level change and get around someone in basketball maybe yeah. you know, versus trying to just make this all about a plyometric exercise that I validate myself with. Uh, sorry for <laughs> that, that trail off at the end, but I, I like bounding because bounding just tells you the type of athlete really well. Yeah, no, hundred percent. So like I'm thinking in my head of like some wide guys in the NBA, like I'm trying to think like PJ Tucker came to mind. Um, obviously some of the bigs are, are easy to say like Joel Embiid, um, cause he's, he's athletic, but it, he's just a big dude. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and I'm trying to think of some other ones. Like I would almost say even like Kawhi Leonard is a little bit, seems like kind of a wide ISA type of guy. He's not like the most explosive. He, he has like some, some bounce to him, but it, how he gets into these movements is, is a little bit more of what I would think like a wide would be. So that's cool. I like to, I like to categorize things you know what i mean yeah. like I, I just it helps me kind of yeah, put by a, nature, paint a picture we're, yeah we're wired for categorization by nature mm-hmm. for sure and it does help especially in the initial level it's helpful to know this but i think for me like i use it just to kind of help my intuition as to mm-hmm. why does this person like this exercise why is this person bad at this why do they run like this and then with that intuition it helps me to make a better decision for them. But I, I, I think I, I try to actually avoid like specifically typecasting until yeah. I get the feel of it in person. Oh, you love lifting and you're white. I say, all right, cool. Let's do some more of that. You know, oh, you hate deep squats and you're super narrow. All right, we'll let's do sandbag squats instead and mostly jump, you know, <laughs> like, it's, right. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's just an intuition enhancer for a coach in my opinion. For sure. No, I like that. So, um, Question about jumping, and and this is something that is like so specific, and I've been waiting to ask uh, for a while because um, I'm good friends with with Jake Tura, and uh, we oh, yeah. we talk a lot. And I asked him this this was a couple of years ago, and he didn't respond to my text, and I was like, uh-huh. "All right, dude." And then he hit me back and was like, "Asked me something totally different." So he he skipped. He's the only person I've ever asked this. And he skipped over it to, to selfishly ask his own question. So now he doesn't get the privilege to answer it. It's going to you. So my question is, why does it seem like the best jumpers have that butt kick in the middle of the air? So they, they, they take off. I'm thinking of one of my athletes. It's right, left takeoff. He gets up. He, he gets probably 30 inches in the air. And then he does a butt kick. And then he probably goes another five to seven inches. Like, what is what is happening at that butt kick? What is that? And and why do the best jumpers have that? Yeah, man, that's a good question. Yeah, I, actually, I'm <laughs> happy to answer that. And I saw you might have heard my son who ran ran down here. I told him I play army men with him later, so he somehow snuck down and asked me to play. This is what happens when you work from home. Yep. Uh, anyway, <laughs> all uh, good. Yeah. Yeah, so this was a, you know, when I was putting together my uh, Elastic Essentials online course, this was kind of, um, I think the year before I put together that course, um, this was a light bulb that went off for me. It was in the middle of an Adarian Bar podcast where we were talking about bounding. And one of the big things with Adarian, uh, if people who don't know who Adarian is, he he's uh, my mentor in all things biomechanics, um, a brilliant, like sees the world of movement in a way that is just completely on another level in an amazing way. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And I had the ability to work with him for years back in the Bay Area in California. And he was talking about the idea of bounding and basically like just really noticing what's happening between your foot and the ground. And he was talking about 
sprinting, this happens too fast, but bounding is slow enough that you can feel this. And again, I don't think basketball players need to bound, but this is, again, just an example. It's meaningful for me, and it's how I've kind of understood and picked up on this, is when you bound, you feel yourself put force in the ground, and then you feel the moment the ground gives back to your body. And it's, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, well, the ground is flat. How can it give force back to me? But it does matter because, honestly, try bounding on a concrete surface versus like a track surface versus a basketball court. They all have their own unique little mini oscillations to them. Mm -hmm. Concrete, not very much, but a basketball court, you would feel it. I wouldn't recommend bounding on a basketball court, by the way. I mean, maybe Euro step training is kind of lateral bounding, but when you, if you just go out and you bound or just try to take long bouncy steps, you will feel this relationship of your foot in the ground and you will feel when the ground gives back. And the trick that Adarian mentioned is when the ground gives back, you go with it. And I was like, okay. And, and when, I, when I had that podcast with him, I had been practicing these things for five years. So for me personally, that made really good intuitive sense. I've said that same phrase to other people in seminars and they were like, what does that mean? <laughs> so I understand that if you're listening, that might not make sense. It is something you have to feel. I can't just, and again, I had said earlier that coaching, a lot of coaching is forebrain to forebrain. It's intellect to intellect. This is something that is intellect to feeling. Every motion you do in sport should have an element of feeling, a very strong element of feeling to it. It's how we play and learn and move. It's pretty much the main thing that actually matters when the rubber meets the road with everything in sport. Mm -hmm. Anyways, in the process of going through that, I found that in bounding, when the ground gave back was kind of later in the stance. So once my foot started to get behind me a little bit more, that's when the ground suddenly is ready to give back and I'll go with it. And what I started to notice with that is that in itself yielded more of this like backside oriented bounding strategy where I'd bound and my leg was kind of like far behind my body. It would whip behind my body. And a lot of track coaches, of course, if you're in track, it's like, oh, don't do that. Everything is front side. Get your knees up, blah, blah, blah. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> and it probably doesn't even matter that much for basketball, who hopefully, thankfully, hasn't been inundated by that element of track and field because I don't think it's helpful. But And even in bounding, if someone's taught bounding, usually they're taught to strike this pose with the knee in front. And so I found that when I bounded and really had this relationship with the ground, and I went when the ground gave back to me, it became incredibly forefoot dominant. So I would feel my forefoot way more. I'd feel my calf activate way more. And I would feel my foot shoot up behind me way more. And so I started to realize that when people do things that are a little bit more backside dominant, and this is the thing is backside mechanics and running are so like, you know, oh, don't do that. That's so demonized. It's like so... I don't, and I think it's that to me lends more towards just a very reductionist viewpoint on sprinting. But what I started to realize is that when you can load the forefoot up really well, what tends to happen is that energy carries into the backside swing of the leg. So if you pretty much do anything and you you load the forefoot enough, it's going to, that energy doesn't just go nowhere. <laughs> it kind mm. of explodes out back behind the body. And in jumping, that gets magnified, in my opinion, because in sprinting, you have a balance. You have when you're running, you have this wheel going and what's happening on the front side should be balanced with the backside. So whatever, however high the knee goes in front, you're going to see the leg a little bit farther behind the body in a natural situation. Some athletes will cut that and try to eliminate backside. Most the only athletes who really get away with it, in my opinion, are people who are extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. and can manufacture that for 100 meters. They struggle to manufacture it further than that. Anyways, in sprinting, so you'll see an elastic sprinter, you'll see that foot come up kind of high back behind the body. Dan Bach talks about, like he calls it high foot, I think. You'll see that in Karsten Warholm, who set the 400-meter world record, who's really bouncy. When he's doing sprint strides on the track, you see these high, this high foot going up in the backside behind him. Uh, so anyways, in a jump that gets magnified in a jump, you're actually loading the foot with even more energy because you have more time, a sprint stride. You may have a 10th of a second, a jump touchdown basketball. You're talking about two tenths. So you have double the time to load the foot with energy. And then the natural outcome of that is going to be, it unloads back behind the body. 
Hmm. To get that, we can go back to skipping. Um, going back to skipping, there's a natural rhythm you have because your body on its own naturally attunes to the ground. And we start to lose that over time Many in many cases. Maybe it's wearing clunky shoes. Maybe it's thinking too much about all our movements or whatever. Um, and then, but I think that a good athlete is someone who never lost it, you know? And so when you see that backswing of the foot, you're just seeing someone who's really attuned to their rhythm, attuned to their relationship between their foot and the ground. And that's all they, I guarantee it's probably not even in their conscious awareness at all. Cause they'd never even had to go there. Just like a cheetah running at 70 miles an hour. Does it have to think about what it's doing? No. Um, so they have rhythm. They have this unconscious awareness of their relationship to the ground. Uh, three, they're very elastic and fascial by nature. I'm sure they have attunement to their elastic system and their foot. Uh, and then that's the outcome you get for is just that recoil. So the question is, how do you get it? You can, you know, it's funny. I back before the popular, you know, the, 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 the version of Ben Patrick you see now with ATG before he was really popular, he had some posts on that. Like he did a lot of like dunk type stuff. Like he'd dunk and then do a depth jump on the landing or these creative yeah. things. And he had something where he was telling people to do that in the jump itself. And I think that's, I actually think for some people that could work because it's, it's, it's a roundabout way of getting there. I, it wouldn't be my way. I would want to create the feeling first and then go to the position. I think you're, the tension creates the position. That was the podcast I just did with Julian Pinot. But I think for some people, by saying, hey, just kick your butt when you jump, that actually could create the tension for them because maybe they forgot how to do that. So mm, yeah, um, you, you could get there both ways. For basically, if, if what, the whole time I was talking about rhythm and the ground giving back, if that confused you thoroughly, then just kick <laughs> your butt when you jump and just notice what it feels like and see if it works. <laughs> No, I love that. That makes sense to me. Um, it's it's along the lines of kind of what I had hypothesized myself. But again, like I wasn't like I've experienced it myself and I know that's not how I jump normal. You know what I mean? And so like if I feel myself jumping and I'm like, oh, I, I can't like that was a really good jump. Like that's that's kind of my way of of I guess coaching myself like because I know I'm not a very elastic person um especially after I had back surgery so like I, I haven't gotten a lot of that back so when I jump if I notice little things like that like that little kickback or just a little return of energy in any way I'm like okay yeah we're on the right track we're going because I know that's not me naturally so it tells me something I did there was good or something that we're doing in training is good. But, you know, almost every athlete that I work with does that. And so I'm like, that's another big differentiator. Like they are uh, freaks and I'm not, and they do that and I don't. So that's like, okay, there's something to that. You know what I mean? Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was jump style. And in basketball, you have various takeoffs and in, in, in jumping in general, you have various takeoffs, but you have, you know, left foot takeoff, right foot takeoff. You have a left, right, right, left. And it, even like kind of like a no penultimate, like a, a jump, like a hop. Uh, I guess it would be a jump stop if, if for lack of a better term. You got like that hop, like Anthony Edwards has basically like this jump stop into his jumps. Um, and I think a lot of basketball players will get good at them individually in like a task dependent scenario so like if you're driving to the right going through the middle of the lane and you don't have space available you'll use a certain type of jump if you're on a fast break you might go to what you uh prefer to use whether it be a right left or whatever but how important do you think it is for basketball players to consciously try to improve each of these jump styles even if it's not what they naturally prefer or even if it's not within the context of the game and the chaos and what space is available. Sure. Yeah. So I would say I'll start with, I'll start with this. There's a few ways to take the question, you know, like you had mentioned, and I do think, I think it's good for coaches to categorize things to help mm -hmm. their intuition. I think it is dangerous to categorize and then put every athlete in that box. Um, 
with that said, I think it's you're very easy to say, all right, you know, like you're a two foot jumper. You know, and again, I think that for basketball, the more ways you can jump, really the better. You know, for like sure. I, ideally, like at least having that ability, you're going to eventually prefer one style. I think what tends to happen is we, you know, like I remember it was funny. It was like maybe 10 years ago or fifth, no, more than that, 15 years ago, like the first products related to jump technique training came out. And I just find that funny because I think about we live in this world where everything has to be commercialized and, and a, a, a price point put on, mm-hmm. you know, even like, you know, even like NFTs, like say what, say what you want or whatever. It's like, everything's going to be, be monetized. It's like, that's the way that the engine of our current financial system is kind of heading is we're at, you know, and so it's just kind of funny. It's like, you know, you hear the saying the best things in life are free. And I think, uh, <laughs> and, like, oh. and jump technique is kind of free in, in yeah. the sense that like, you like in the perfect world, I wouldn't say a single thing. Like if I coached a group, let's just say I decided to coach a group of um, like nine and 10 year old basketball players and I coached them all the way up to high school. I just stuck with them every year, you know, and I, Mm -hmm. I coached them every year and I, and I did their skills. I did their tactics. I did their strength stuff in a, in a perfect world, even as I've overhauled the jump process so many times in my perfect world, I wouldn't say a thing about it. Because it's the same mm-hmm. thing as like, you know, I don't know, you're going to go teach a frog how to jump any better. Like, uh, or like, it's funny, it's like a flea, like a flea jumps 100 times body weight. Are you going to go to do some PhD research on it and <laughs> find some ways for that flea to find, jump higher? And you have to realize that at least some, if not all, of that instinctual ability is present in every human being. And you watch how, especially to me, the most, I would call evolved takeoff is the running two foot jump. If you look at dunk contests from between the, like the eighties till today, I think that the biggest upgrades in technique, if you want to call it that has been the running two foot takeoff. I think that one leg takeoffs were always pretty innate, you know, like Mm -hmm. look at Dr. J back in the day. That's just kind of, it's just a continuation of the running cycle. We get it. You know, we've been long jumping. Bob Beeman jumped almost what the world record is now off one leg 60 or whatever years ago. But I think that we have, because of a hoop that's 10 feet in the air and I mean, volleyball has been around like this too, but Mm -hmm. volleyball, you don't spin, you know, you jump and you do a linear takeoff. Now you're seeing just such a cool um, way the human body has taken a two-leg takeoff. You see it's kind of like the running two-leg takeoff in basketball. It involves an acceleration, and it involves kind of like a, a swing. Like, like it, it yeah. involves the, the spinning components of a swing. And then it involves a squat and a hinge. There's all these cool components all squeezed into this thing. But because there's so much complexity wrapped up into a running two-leg jump, well, where do you start with coaching it? You know, like, <laughs> would you even try? Right. I, I find every strength coach I've talked to, like volleyball strength coaches, they all say like, yeah, every time I say something about an athlete's jump, they always jump lower. So I just stop saying it. Yeah. And from my experience, it like the people who sell jump technique, look, if an athlete's jump technique is horrible because they're just not a great athlete or they have almost no practice with that thing, that skill, yeah, telling them to have like a longer penultimate step might yield some initial improvement but then you have to think are you kind of potentially reducing their top ceiling because maybe they're thinking long penultimate and all these you know down the line i've heard of i know coaches who work with volleyball players who have been told hey you really need a long penultimate and then these volleyball players come to this coach and they are literally jumping up through their penultimate screwing it up because of something a coach told them Mm -hmm. So I do always view it anything with jump training and technique is everything I tell an athlete potentially reducing their ceiling if they take it the wrong way. So for me, it's more how can I create constraints to help you self-organize just better jumping? And so for me, I think on one level, it's, you know, if it's young athletes, like let's say I had like a 11 and 12 year old team and I just wanted to make sure they're well-rounded and jumping. Well, the first thing I would say if this was a possibility. I would say play volleyball in the off season and go do track in the off season. You know, go do those things. Like you know, and honestly, if you do those things and you do long jump and high jump and you do volleyball takeoffs, 
you're probably yeah. going to be pretty good. Like <laughs> yeah, you get I, them all right what, there. Yeah. What else do I have to tell you? <laughs> you know, like yeah. <laughs> I, maybe a little bit, but I mean, not a lot. And so, and I talked about that, like that box parkour thing. I don't know. Do you like parkour in the woods or go jump over bound across different boxes? Like even my kids, like we'll go to the stream and we'll like make a game out of jumping across different rocks in the stream or we'll make mm-hmm. an obstacle course in the living room. And I'm watching them literally put together everything they need at least for one leg jumps again running two leg is the last thing that kind of comes along in my opinion a five-year-old can run and jump off one leg it takes longer i've never i mean you've seen an occasion like hell here's this like kid who loves dunking a five-year-old who loves dunking and maybe they have it but that running spinning skill the running two leg jump just takes longer but i believe that is also a product of playing a lot of sports it is the product of playing like baseball and swinging things you know because there's mm-hmm. rotation into it. Um, it's, it. It's also, in my opinion, the product of fast changes of direction. Like if you run in hard cut and hard cut and hard cut, the same spin to do a hard cut is also present there. So honestly, playing like soccer it, you, you, or, or whatever, like, like soccer is like the ultimate sport for that in some sense of the word. So athletes kind of construct their peak based off of their experience in different sports that have cutting and swinging and all these components to it. And so I just look at that. How much better is it for an athlete to do all these sports and just practice jumping and eventually figure it out? And the only thing I'll do extra that kind of gets an athlete, like if I work with like a 12 year old athlete and jumping is part of what we're working on, I'll say, hey, we will have a hurdle and I'll say, hey, jump over it, do a 180 jump over it and land on the other side. Yeah. And that's it. Literally, that's it. I'm not going to try to tell you. It's just by doing enough 180s. Now you have to start getting that rotational component in there on your own without me saying a thing. And, and you eventually will figure that out more over time. But I also have 12 year olds who don't need a lick of coaching. They have the jump skill like within 98% of what I would even think is perfect and their body's got it. So, um, and yeah, I would say too, for like, yeah, for, I think once an athlete has reached a certain level, like you could say, well, I don't know, should we teach LeBron how to jump better off two feet? You know, cause he's more of a one leg guy. Right. No, nah, probably not. Like, you know, it's just I think once you get to a certain level, it probably doesn't matter anymore. You've you've molded your game around a certain skill set. And, you know, if you get a few more inches here or there, it's probably good, but it might not break, you know, be a game breaker either. Right. Yeah. It's not going to move the needle in terms of like what what your skills are. Like you've made it this far having these takeoffs and knowing when to use them. So, yeah, yeah I totally I totally agree. It's crazy that you brought up like the 180 jumps. Those are some of my favorite things. I, I saw you doing the drop jump uh, into like a uh, between the legs, like dunk type thing, you know, like on a, a nerf. Off the depth jump, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So the, that that type of stuff has been great because I do work with a lot of kids. Like I remember at the beginning of the basketball season, like basically all my pro guys were, were back with their teams. And I was kind of in a little bit more like um, – I guess, advanced mode in my head. And I started working with this sixth grade basketball team like the next week. In the first session, I had them doing like like broad jumps, uh, single leg broad jumps, like stuff that's not bad, but it's like a little serious, I think, for them. And uh, we were doing a little bit of like skip work, but nothing like super fun. And I left the practice and I was like, that sucked. Like they hated that. And yeah. <laughs> they did not enjoy that. And so the next time I came, started implementing like some of that stuff, like um, chasing balloons, uh, yep. doing hand-eye coordination stuff with like sliding and, and tossing uh, beanbags to your partner, jumping over stuff, doing a 180, uh, different kind of things like that. And I remember there was this one drill that I did where there, I was having them basically defensive slide from volleyball line to volleyball line. And they all started at a different point. So like, it's like chaos there. Nobody, it's not like one line. And then I'm having one guy um, dribble through his teammates full court. So it's like, if you can imagine like all these little gaps that are happening, um, he has to find the gaps and, and dribble through them and they're not facing him. Their backs are to him. So they can't like interrupt what he's actually trying to do. So it's just like presenting gaps and chaos and trying to find it is fun. 
And so the kid, the kids were like, what's that drill called? And I was like, I don't know. What do you, what do you want to call it? And they were like, let's call it do it every practice. And I was like, <laughs> all right, let's do it every practice. And so I was just like, whoa, that makes such a difference. And we're still, we're still getting the qualities that I would have trained with a, with a box jump or a broad jump or doing like hardcore sprint training and mechanics work, but it's more, it meets them where they are. And I think yeah. that's such a good opportunity for them because a lot of these kids, this is, this is a, a lot of these kids didn't make their middle school team. That's why they're in season in this league that I'm in. So it hit me like, that's not what they need. They need more games. They need more play. They need more yeah. skill acquisition from a general standpoint. So maybe next year they can make their school team. Then it gets a little bit more serious, but I still think we should keep elements of fun, you know, forever. But I just want to throw that in there because it was a funny story of, you know, hey, what drill is this? And now we call it every practice. <laughs> we call it every practice drill. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I do find it is funny how a lot of times the private sector stuff I, I see I've seen this is the kids the 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 view is, oh, well, I'm gonna do these output drill like the standing broad jump and, and we're going to get yeah. that up and then somehow you're magically going to go make the team when in reality what <laughs> kind of ends up happening as i see is the kids end up just liking lifting more and then they kind of stick around the gym and just lift heavy weights later and they don't actually right. play you know and right well you know they you gave them you know they like lifting and that's cool that's a meaningful part of their life but it's like well look if you want to make the team i mean you know or, or even honestly just enjoy sport more because i think that's mm-hmm. something that i've Part, an important part of my life that I always know I have to have is just playing games and learning to really embrace all the things that happen in a game are is such an underrated part of the physical fitness and movement component. I just think that, honestly, we all just, every, every lunch across America, we all just shut down and you got to play whatever <laughs> game you liked. Maybe Seriously. it's spike ball, maybe it's volleyball or pickup softball, whatever. I think we'd all be in a better place. So, you know, versus... Uh, I got to go do the Metcon or the heavy lift. Yeah. Not that, that stuff isn't inherently valuable, but it's just our, we have such a closed view of, of the possibilities of fitness when it all really revolves around play for the most part as a starting point, And then it branches mm-hmm. out based off what you're into. But yeah, yep. yeah I, love, I love that story. They like to do it every day. That's, that's where it's at. Yeah. The mental and emotional yeah. stimulation will carry the session. 100%. So um, we talked a lot about jumping. I wanted to get into a little bit of sprint stuff, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. So we might have to do a part two uh, a couple months down the road. We'll see what happens. But I do want to throw you into the hot seat, which is just oh, yeah. like 10 random nonsense questions just to kind of end on a on a fun note like we talked about, you know, fun. So hopefully you will come back and do the part two. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Yeah. I like nonsense questions or whatever. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like taking a break from uh, a sport quest. Pure sport oh yeah. Stuff too, so it's always good. hundred percent. All right. So you can go, you can go rapid response. You can go deep, whatever you want to do. I'm just going to ask them and then we'll go from there. So <laughs> this is kind of funny right off the bat. If you had to use jump sole shoes today in your training, how would you implement them? Probably, uh, probably running a 5K. <laughs> Actually, I, I only say that because I'm very intrigued with, like, Dan Bach had said this on the podcast, like that he was getting better reactive strength indices out of some cross country runners than some of the basketball players, and oh, wow. which I, I could I could see that for a clod hopper basketball player, I could absolutely see that because you know yeah. you just think about the elastic qualities built up by running on uneven terrain and stuff, and so. Um, I'd be, I don't know. I don't know if I'd do a 5k, but I'd be curious as to the, um, <laughs> the non-traditional endurance just to see what happened, uh, how my cat, what happened to my calves and yeah. building up to something like that. I'd be curious. Um, what's your all time favorite movie? Oh man. Um, you know, it, it's, it sounds like super lame. I don't know. I mean, it's, it sounds so, uh, like a, like a typical nerdy thing to say, but I do. I, I love star Wars. The, the original, 1980s star wars series i and the the older i get the more i appreciate george lucas's screenwriting and like all the underlying themes like it was just in my own podcast julian pino was talking about there's a scene in the empire strikes back where luke goes in this cave and fights darth vader but then vader's mask comes off and it's himself and it's like it actually goes right. into our own shadow <laughs> and like our own yeah. shadow side and our and how we see the world through our, I mean, it's like there's so much good stuff in there i'm like as soon as my kids are ready i'm gonna definitely show it to them and, 
So <laughs> yeah, I, I I would say those were, and they those made an impact on my early like just kind of like it's just what I was excited about. It's nostalgic. So that's what I always kind of go to, and largely because as I get older, like the screenwriting component and the philosophical yeah. elements, I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, you start to appreciate that stuff more. Um, do you have any hidden talents? <laughs> uh, oh, man, I don't know. I mean, I, I could juggle, but that's not really, you know, it's kind of funny because you, you, that's a fitness thing now. You know, I don't learn juggle mm-hmm. skill set. I, oh, man, I'm trying to think of what else that's not, I don't know. I, I, I'm boring with that. I'll just, I'll just say juggling, you know, um, amateur guitar player, trying to get nice. better at that. So, nice. Yeah. What was your first job you ever had? Oh, well, the actual like one I would say that someone paid me money for was <laughs> four dollars an hour landscaping, which this completely skewed my attitude towards work. This was hard work, working land landscaping. Some guy, my parents knew this guy for four dollars an hour and my, my brother was all about it he was working hard doing all this root pulling and mowing the lawn and moving stuff and i was like this is bull man i was like i yeah. don't this isn't worth four dollars like and this was back then before you know the inflation's gotten crazy but i don't know that was man that soured me for work for a long time it wasn't <laughs> until uh i did moving like which isn't like a glamorous job but it was yeah. fun uh, for uh, somewhat fun uh when i was 18 that i kind of finally worked hard and got paid okay not great but yeah. okay and like felt better about working <laughs> so <laughs> yeah pulling pulling roots for four dollars an hour is my first job and i only did that job one time i didn't go back <laughs> that's tough yeah that is that is a rude awakening right there all right uh this is a good one i i actually asked this because i had a like a, a lifelong funny story about this in my own world but where was the first place that you went after you got your driver's license? I honestly, I don't remember. <laughs> I, 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 I have no idea. Sorry. <laughs> I try to, if it comes to me later, uh, I will, I'll, I'll throw it in the next question, but I can't remember. All good. All, man. All good. I kind of maybe, feel bad that I don't know. I mean, maybe it's not significant. Maybe it's just like, like maybe. So I, I'll make it quick, but basically the first place I went was, to one of my basketball tournaments. But the thing was, I'd never driven myself to a basketball tournament. It was always mom and dad. So what should have been like a routine, like 20 minute trip to this school, that's literally like three turns away. It's like you go down one street for the majority of the time you turn, then you turn. But anyway, um, I didn't know how highways worked. Like, (laughs) I had never had to really pay attention on the highway. I've driven on the highway, but never had to like pay attention. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm 33. So it was like, you had to like the print print map quest at that time um, or go off memory. So anyway, I'm going to this tournament and I get to, uh, I'm living in Indianapolis and I get to 74, which is a highway that takes you to Cincinnati. And the, the big sign was like Indianapolis, left Cincinnati straight and I didn't know like how those signs worked and so I'm like okay well I don't want to go to Cincinnati so I got to go this way whole time it was just like you know it's saying like if you know in the future if you stay on this path you'll go to Cincinnati Mm -hmm. but I end up I'm on the highway for like 40 minutes and I'm like something ain't right like I've been to the school that we're playing at like I don't I don't remember any of this so I stop at the gas station, call my dad. I'm like, Dad, I'm lost. I don't know where I'm going. He's like, where are you? So I tell him where I'm at. And I'm like in a city that's, I mean, it's it's like, I don't know, 35 minutes out of the way of where I was supposed to be. All because I just, it was literally the first place I ever drove. And I'll never forget that because now like I see those signs all the time. And I'm just like, those are kind of confusing. Like they're not. Yeah. They're they're not exactly literal, but I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just an idiot, and nobody else has that first driving story. I've done something like that I'm sure, a bunch of times. <laughs> I, I I know I have, <laughs> especially early. I'm horrible at directions. My four year old son yeah. is already showing that he's better at directions than I am. <laughs> so, all right, uh, we got about five more. So, 
well, growing up, this kind of still nostalgic questions right here, but growing up, uh, what was your dream job? I never had one, to be honest. I really I've been, um, yeah, oh, yeah. I never had, like I said, I, I got that first job, $4 an hour, and I'm like, work sucks. <laughs> like, I didn't want to grow up. Like, I was always afraid yeah. of the real world. And I think it was because I never, nothing that was presented ever sounded good to me mm. and it was funny because like i had people in high school they're like oh i'm gonna do this or that or some guys like oh you can get make this amount of money doing this kind of obscure job that and they they were very practical a lot of my classmates it's, and i was i always had to do something i was passionate about but i never i never knew that you could and i don't come from a family of entrepreneurs or anyone mm. you know i came from a family of go do you know go to college find something that pays x do that and so, yeah, I always avoided the real world until I think I figured out that I could do my own thing. It just took a really long time yeah. so, for those those passions to align. And I also was very fortunate, I have to say, at the $4 an hour, that I was in a position where I didn't have to, you know, I still had food, you know, I still had right. clothes. So I know there's a lot of people who are not at the luxury of being able to avoid a job that doesn't pay very much. And I'm right. very aware of that. I was at least blessed in, in my own situation that I could focus more on sports and sadly video games for my young life <laughs> very unfortunate i wish i would have done a lot of other things but well here i am for sure um do you believe in aliens um i would say yes um but i'm not sure i i i love graham hancock if uh you're familiar with graham hancock he's got a really popular thing on netflix uh this is just a rabbit hole for people is that maybe to make the consideration that um, versus, or maybe there's, you know, truth to them being on other planets, but also there being an interdimensionality and to aliens, mm. what aliens are now to us, you hear reports like fairies, like 600 years ago from a, a similar perspective. And so as well as perhaps being from another planet, they're also being, uh, interdimensional opportunities. So that's just, gotcha. got, that's like a huge weird turn at the end, <laughs> but, uh, I, I like those questions. I like it. All right, I know you're a competitor. Um, you still like to compete and play games and sports. What's the weirdest thing you've ever done to gain a competitive advantage? Oh, man. Uh, you know, I, the only thing I can think of is there used to be these little, um, they called them Springbok insoles back 25 years. I don't know if they exist anymore, but it was this little like piece. It's basically like a hard piece of rubber you put in your shoe. I know they have the victory insoles now, like the actual, mm -hmm. like they're actual springs. <laughs> these were um yeah you, these were just like i don't know you wouldn't the, supposedly they helped you jump higher i don't i don't know how but you put them in the bottom <laughs> of your shoes and so i i had those in my shoes every game oh i will say too i shaved my legs in college uh because supposedly that helped you jump higher so i'd shave my legs yeah I remember <laughs> i shaved my legs before meets i'll say it felt good like I, i'll say like it felt like the air on my legs like, felt really yeah. good and I, I i i think it helped so I shaved my legs too that like a few times back in my early twenties. <laughs> hey, that's not that's not horrible. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. I think Swimmers like many all the time. Manny Pacquiao like drinks his own pee or something like that. Yeah. Like so that, that's that's I would have done that too. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that's way past my my level of competitiveness. I'm I'm probably gonna stop it right before that. Um all right, two more. If you had to cook a meal for your hero whoever that hero is um you're having them over for dinner and and you're cooking wh what are you going to make them i guess it depends on who my hero is um <laughs> yeah I that's like a 1a one, one b like who's who's your hero and what are you cooking for them yeah I, I guess it i guess it just depends on what i think they like i i don't mm. know i'm um yeah i i i haven't you know it's fine i used to cook a lot until i had kids <laughs> barely cooking. man i used I to make that. all sorts like chicken piccata and all this like different like i used to have i had a slow cooker like um like smoke like briskets and stuff and mm -hmm. i don't know man kids in a business that's taking me out taking it out of me but i, I hope to get back to it soon i don't know yeah. I, I guess it depends on what they like i feel that all right last one if you could have any superpower what would it be and why oh man um <laughs> Maybe the maybe the ability to see uh, athletes move the way a Darian Barr sees them at any given second. I just, <laughs> that would be fun. That guy sees everything, man. It'd be crazy to see what he sees on a high level. Yeah, I don't know. I, I 
The I, I that's a that's a good question. Yeah, maybe that. I'll just go with that. I, I can't. Uh, I probably my brain's starting to fill up with some other things, but we'll just go with that one for now. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. His his outlook is uh, like I don't even know. Mind blowing, I guess is the word. Yeah, it's yeah. All right, man. That's that's all we got today. Uh, I, once again, I appreciate you jumping on here and uh, and going through all this information with us. Before we get out of here, why don't you tell the audience kind of, you know, where they can find you, where they can get some of these resources that we talked about and all that good stuff. Yeah, sure. So I uh, head to justflysports.com. Um, it's just fly sports on Instagram and Twitter. And yeah, my book Speed Strength is on Amazon as well as the old school vertical foundations. It's funny. I still get people post about that every now and then, even though it nice. seems like an ancient. Um, the things I'm really excited about is my online course, Elastic Essentials, which has encapsulates a lot of things that we've talked about and it was fun putting that one together because it it was this it, it was this moment when I had left Cal that I had to decide what do I really think about training like and, and put it down mm-hmm. on paper and make a course out of it so that's the one I'm really excited about uh you can check that out it's on my website and uh yeah you can find me there awesome man thanks a lot yeah thank you for having me Justin and that was episode 15 again with Joel Smith owner of Just Fly Sports and podcast host of the Just Fly Performance Podcast. If you guys like that episode and want to learn more, you can head to his Instagram, Just Fly Sports, or head over to his website to branch off from there if you can access any of his courses, his books, his blogs. Joel has been producing free information for a long time that I've been consuming, Um, but all of that stuff is super useful and, and relevant to the conversation that we had today. So before I get out here, I always like to ask, help me show Joel how much his episode impacted you, how much you learned. So whatever platform you're on, whether it be YouTube, Spotify, Apple, go ahead and leave a review on that platform, whether it be a comment or a rating. That way, when Joel sees this, he's able to see how big of an impact his episode is having on the industry. Um, Make sure you guys do that because not only it helps me selfishly grow the show, But it's huge for me to be able to show the appreciation to my guests on on how much their time is valuable and how much I appreciate that valuable time and giving you guys access to the information and the knowledge that they share on this episode. So some I always like to ask for, it means a lot to me and it means a lot to my guests as well. So again, leave that feedback if you have a chance. And until episode 16, stay tuned. We got a special guest coming next week that I'm really excited about. So I'll see you guys then.